and welcome, greetings, salutations, and welcome to another episode of Wednesday Night Book Club with your host Andy Rice, that's me, part of Fried Rice Podcast, let's get fried. With me as always is AI generated classical music because I'm here alone. Uh, Last week we discussed very briefly, more of just a, a pilot episode of the uh, novel Mad uh, Rose Matter, I almost said Mad Hatter, but uh, Rose Matter, which I don't know if I mentioned last time, but um, that's a color, Rose Matter. It's it's like a type of uh, pinkish red, and I really like that. I liked learning that there's a color called Rose Matter, and I don't understand why it's called Rose Matter. Like I know that we have a color rose. So maybe this is just the more aggressive version of it. One moment. (coughs) (coughs) Sorry about that. But just like everything in life, I like to get high before doing whatever it is I'm going to do. So... Last week was Rose Matter. This week, the book that I read, and I'm going to say that again, I read it even though I listened to it on audiobook. Again, come at me, bros, if you think that that's not the same thing. If you think that somehow using your eyes as opposed to your ears somehow makes you a better person when it comes to consuming literature, you know what? Come at me. And I'll have a uh, a toe-to-toe debate with you on any book that we could that we both consume at the same time. You come at me. The only thing that you would have on me is that you'd be able to tell me how things uh, like names are spelled in a way that maybe I wouldn't, but I'll be able to tell you how they're pronounced. Okay, let's go back to Harry Potter for a moment. When you were a kid, who knew how to say Hermione's name? No one. Nobody fucking knew how to say it. In my mind, I read those books and I thought, okay, here's H-named girl with curly brown hair. Because I knew her name wasn't Hermone or whatever, whichever I, however I thought to say it back in the day. And so, yeah. So reading, yeah, you can, you'd be able to write her name down, but like audiobook would tell you, oh, Hermione. And you'd be like, oh shit, yeah, okay. That's a weird name, but at least I know how to say it. You had to wait to the movies, motherfuckers. But so did I, because I don't think they had audiobooks for Harry Potter at the time when I was reading them. And, to be honest, I wasn't really into audiobooks back in the day, because I I just preferred to read, I guess. And I wasn't driving around, and I didn't have as much kind of idle time to spend listening. So I do understand that there are benefits to both. You know, like, listening to an audiobook while driving through traffic, there's something, there's almost nothing better, because it's like watching a movie in your head to just kill the time, but trying to tire yourself at the end of the night, you know, get a book and and have your eyes kind of do the repetitive motion of going back and forth and reading the lines and having that information in your head, that's also great because, you know, it helps you fall asleep and put some cool images in your head before you go to sleep, so I'm assuming your dreams are pretty cool, at least uh, I always try to, at night, trick my brain into having cool dreams and I don't think it ever works. So, like, I'll uh, deliberately watch, like, a cutscene from Final Fantasy, like a Final Fantasy game, 9, 8, 10, whatever. You just, just one of the older ones. Uh, I'll, I'll watch the cutscene, and I'll try to, you know, put myself in those, in those situations. Because it's like, I would want nothing more. If you want to talk about dream place I'd want to live, would be, like, in a Final Fantasy world. Because... You don't have to fight monsters if you don't want. I think I I, I would, maybe. Um, There's ways to bring people back from the dead. You have Phoenix Down. So, like, that's pretty cool. You have potions that just heal you. So, like, oh, you're shit. You're all fucked up. Here's a potion, right? You're you're done. You're healed. Um, And, you know what? That's that's a, a discussion for a completely different series that I'm working on. This does with has to do with video games, obviously. So you know what? Let's just move past this, past this, and actually talk about the completely unrelated to anything I've been talking about so far book that we're we're watching uh, that we're, that we read this week, and it's uh, Lovecraft Country by Matt Ruff, twenty sixteen. Um, so Lovecraft Country, it is a story about a, a black family in the fifties 
in uh, you know Jim just that I think Jim Crow era laws were just ending, and this was like just pre civil rights, you know. So like um, it's that in between time. Um, I think there were still Jim Crow laws, obviously in the South. We see that throughout here, but um, as you know, in the North, it wasn't. You know, it was more accepting. Uh, and you follow them on a Twilight Zone esque science fiction horror. H.P. Lovecraft inspired adventure, which I could just not get enough of. So um, if you're familiar with the TV show, which I think probably more people have seen the TV show than read the book, I would imagine. Uh, and there are pros and cons to the TV show, I think, and to the book, uh, which I'll get into. And I'll try not to keep this too long. Um, again, these are just... I read a lot and I want to get these thoughts down more for my own uh, records, if anything, because like I, I go back to I look at these books that I've read and I try to think, how did I, you know, like, I get like vague vibes on how I felt about them. But like I want to, you know, just for my own knowledge, be able to come back and see what I felt about these things. So the novel Lovecraft Country, let's just get into it. Atticus Turner, his dad Montrose, his uncle George Berry, his wife Hippolyta Berry. Uh, then we have Letitia and Ruby Dandridge. They are neighbors of Atticus. Um, and Ruby is, uh, they're, they're sisters. And then you have Samuel and Caleb Braithwaite, who are the antagonists of the of the whole thing. Um, so Atticus Turner in the show is played by uh, Jonathan Majors. So uh, that's a problem because he got canceled recently. And the actor who played Montrose Turner passed away. So the... They did. He did write a. Uh, Matt Ruff did write a sequel to Lovecraft Country, which I just started last night, called Destroyer of All Worlds or Destroyer of Worlds. And so far, the beginning is epic. It's a. It's like a flashback um, of a slave escaping a plantation in a in a very uh, cool kind of brutal way, which I liked um, a lot. And I think it's going to follow more of the. The, well, I mean, obviously it's going to follow more Turners because he, uh, which is Atticus and Montrose's last name. So this must be their their um, ancestor. And so the I, so I, I haven't really gotten into it yet. But the chances of us getting a TV show based on Destroyer of Worlds, low. If it, Unless they're going to just recast. They'd have to just recast the whole thing. So if they did that, sure. But um, anyway... This book sort of feels like a TV show in a way. Each chapter is a connected yet separate story following its own character, doing its own thing. It's not like Atticus is really only the main... He's like the main through line, and he's kind of the main character in the first one, um, in the first part, the, the, the chapter called Lovecraft Country. And after that, it gets into... you know Each character has their own journey and I and I would even say Atticus isn't even my favorite character in here um, which we'll get to so Lovecraft Country it opens up with Atticus uh, trying to make his way to uh, he gets to Chicago and then he he, he takes uh, his uncle George and then unbeknowingly he takes or and he also takes Leticia uh, and they go to try to go to Artem which is a place uh Oh, they get a mysterious letter from Mo from Montrose, Atticus's dad, and they have to go to Artem. And unfortunately, here's the thing: I never, I haven't read the H.P. Lovecraft books yet, and I, I feel like I need to. I found on Audible they have the complete H.P. Lovecraft uh, collection, and it's I think 51 hours long, which is pretty pretty hefty. Uh, and with Audible, which I love, is that no matter the length or collection, like if they put something into one book, you can buy it for one credit. So if you're on Audible, here's a trick. Uh, if you So a credit costs about $11 last time I checked. And you have to be, uh, you, you get three a month? Or you get one a month? I think you get one a month. Uh, and you, you can buy more though. And I think you buy three at a time. That's what I'm thinking of. That's what I'm thinking about because I'll, I'll, you know, I'll buy probably three, you know, three a month, right? And so, uh, when you, but you want to spend your credits wisely because 
there's books out there that are, you know, 40, 50 hours long and they're collections and you get a lot more bang for your buck that way. If you find a book that's on sale that you really want to read for like six bucks, just buy the book as opposed to spending a credit because your credit's worth 11. So anything above 11 is worth spending a credit on. And that, there's a lot of books that are over 11 on there. So it's, it's pretty, uh, you know, like that's just my way of thinking. Do your own thing. Uh, support who you want to support, whatever. So he picks up uh, George and then uh, George tells him about, so they have, uh, George runs the Safe Negro Guide, which is a traveling guide for, um, God, I don't want to say ne Negroes the whole time because they say it all the time in the book. And I know that's, that's how they referred to it back in the day. And I don't want to just keep saying black people or African Americans. I don't even know what to say here. So I'll just... Man, uh, this is not, again, of course, the, the first book I choose was uh, Rose Matter, and that's about domestic abuse, which I know nothing about, and now I pick Lovecraft Country about racial tensions in the South. Again, I'm a fucking expert over here, right? So, maybe I should pick a book next time that, I'll just pick a book about a, a fat guy that lives alone. And um, thinks he can he can start a podcast and that no one's gonna, ever going to listen to. Uh, if I can find that book, then I'll I'll be able to tap into something. But uh, so his uncle's telling him this uh, this story about this guy that he knows who's doing some work for the Safe Negro Guy, and he's making his way to. Uh, I don't know, he's in Chicago maybe. I, I, I know that they're on the way to Chicago. Whatever. He's making his way somewhere and he's in the South and he's about to get to a town and he's like, I gotta I gotta take a piss. I can't stop in this town because though, though I know it's gonna happen. They're gonna tell me no and it might get worse from there. So he finds like a little forested area which we've all done, you know, and he goes and he urinates and when he gets back he didn't hear that a, a, a police car had pulled up behind him. There's a police deputy there, obviously a racist one. Doesn't know why a black guy's here. He even says to him, he goes, like, why? So you decided to, where are you from, right? Oh, you decided to drive 100 miles out into my woods to take a piss, right? And so then he tells him about what I had never heard about. And I don't know if that's a critique on the, on the education system, but like this was never talked about. Um, if we're just in, if we're just going to be for just one moment, uh, if we, I'm just going to cut myself off for a second. The amount of knowledge that I received about how poorly black people were treated, like, and, and the amount of atrocities that happened to them, we only got skin surface of that in school. Like, in my mind, I was like, yeah, it's bad. We treated them poor. Like, then I say we, but I'm just saying, um, like, Americans at the time, white Americans at the time, treated them poorly. Like, really, really badly. Like, subhuman, like, animals, they they, they, they uh, would lynch them and, and, you know, whatever, right? Like, it was like a whole bunch of horrible things. But I didn't know just how bad it was because... I had never known until uh, watching the the Watchmen TV show opening that there was the Tulsa Wall Street massacre, and that that's when black people had their own Wall Street on in Tulsa that was doing great and very successful. And then you had a bunch of white guys with guns come in and kill indiscriminately and burn it all down, right? And why didn't we learn about that? That's that happened in America. That's one of the most, like, that's a that's a savage, horrific thing that happened. That's such a big event that would have been covered, right, by, I would hope, all the newspapers in the world, right? How we hear about that shit all the time now. If, 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 if a group of people were to run into somewhere, kill everybody, and then burn their shit down, we would know about it. I mean, I, I know that's modern day and everyone knows everything. But even back then, that would have been something. That would have been reported on, I would hope. But anyway, I didn't learn about it until freaking the TV show Watchmen. And then now, cut forward to Lovecraft Country, the TV show, which I'd, I'd seen before. So, I mean, I, I've known this now, but it's still, what a shocking concept, is a sundown city or 
or a sundown county in this case, which means that if you catch a black person outside after sundown, that it's okay to lynch them on the spot. And that is absolutely fucking insane. And so in the story, this guy, he gets done, um, you know, taking a piss. He gets out, he sees the cop. And the guy's like, why, you know, why are you doing this? And he tells the guy, um, George's employee, the safe Negro guide, he, uh, he tells him, yeah, this is a sundown county. And uh, you've got about seven minutes by my watch till sundown. And the guy's like, well, I'll get out of here real quick. I'll, I'll just, not if you're going south, you're not. And then so the guy has, he literally in six minutes, he has to go just under the speed limit so he doesn't get pulled over. And he's, it's the most nerve wracking like situation. You have the cop just tail, you know, just tailing him, right? You have this guy just going just under the speed limit. He just breaks out of the county line right as the sun is setting. Six minutes. The cop gets out of the car, stops his car, gets out, pulls his gun out, and just starts firing at the car. Doesn't kill the dude, but, like, of course he just starts firing at the car. Like, that's just the, the, the sadistic kind of nature of it all that sickened me, fascinated me. I don't know. if uh, it's It's a weird, you know feeling where it's just like this really actually happened we had people so cruel so fucked up that they that they would want to just kill a guy that they found it's like what um how how do you even breed that amount of hate into somebody how does how does that even happen i mean what am i i'm not gonna solve racism i'm just a fucking like i said fat guy doing a podcast let's uh so they, um, anyway, that's just a, as George and Atticus and Letitia are traveling to Artem, um, which again, sorry, they got a letter that Montrose, uh, Atticus is dead who, and Atticus had just gotten out of the army. So he hasn't seen his, he just got out. He's heading back. He got a letter. His dad's in some place called Artem. He misreads it as Arkham, which at first I was thinking Batman, but I'm now I'm thinking the Batman writers just named Arkham Asylum after H.P. Lovecraft something or other. So, which I still don't know what Arkham is because I haven't read H.P. Lovecraft. But maybe there will be an episode down the line where I cover Destroyer of Worlds and the entire H.P. Lovecraft collection. Uh, that'll be a long episode, so just prep for that one. And I will preface it all by telling you how much I love audiobooks. So, uh... Atticus and Letitia and George are heading to Artem and they pass through this uh, this town. So they're checking the Safe Negro Guide and there's a diner in this little town that's friendly to black people. And so they're pulling up and they notice that the it's a different name for the building. But he's like, eh, you know, maybe they just change the name. They're still being cautious. They go inside. It's a white guy at the counter, a guy at, or, and there's a white guy behind the counter and the white guy at the counter slams his fist down when he sees him, gives him a dirty look and leaves. They're starting to get an uncomfortable feeling. They, I think they order some food or whatever, but then they notice that, uh, as they're sitting down again, something I didn't, I had to learn through a book, but they're talking about, uh, George asks Atticus, do you know why the White House is white? And Atticus says, of course. It's after the, no, I'm going to butcher this, but after some sort of engagement, the White House like burnt down. I don't know if it burnt down all the way, but it definitely burned. And so they had slaves repaint the entire house white. And as they're sitting there, they notice that the place they're sitting in is a freshly painted restaurant. Which means that the, and then like, I'm, and I'm thinking like, oh, and then when it hits you where you're just like, oh shit, that means that the friendly two black people owners of that restaurant had their place burned down. And then now it's in the hands of somebody else. Then they look outside and there's a fire truck, uh, full of angry residents, uh, white guys, and they are now in a chase. And so they get out of there. Um, they make the, she, Letitia does something. Uh, God, why can't I remember? She uh, does a distraction, and then they all escape. 
And as they get to Arnhem, well, that's when things... Okay, so then, then they get to Arnhem. And that's when you find... Okay, so the whole crux of this Lovecraft country, the whole like plot of it is that there's a, a family called the Braithwites. They are mod, they're sorcerers, alchemists, whoever, however they want to describe themselves, in natural philosophers, you know, however they decide that they want to refer to themselves as. But they are a society of men, the two of them plus a society of men, the Order of the Ancient Dawn, um, are, they do have powers to some extent. And what I like about this book is that the powers that they have are not too extreme. Um, they're, they're cool and, they, and, they're, and they're, you know, fantastical, but, and, but um, they're not like, like no one's just flying around. No one's just like doing super powered shit. Like uh, one of them has immunity, so he's using like ancient uh, the the atom uh, the I don't know, they say this word a thousand times. Why can't I think of it? But the atom language, the um, oh man, there's a different word for it. I, I, ah, anyway, the the language of atom, ancient atom language, and he has those symbols on, so he's basically immortal slash invincible. Uh, I think people, but what what makes him invincible, which I like, isn't that you can riddle him with bullets and he and it won't affect him. It's that you're no matter who you are or what you're trying to do, you will never be compelled to hurt him. So you'd never be able to pull the trigger. You wouldn't be able to raise the gun or or hit him or whatever, right? It's like a cool. Uh, it's a different type of immunity, which I which I like. Um, you find out that Atticus is the descendant of a slave. Of who an escaped slave who left right as the one of the founders of the Order of Ancient Dawn, one of the bigger sorcerer guys, was trying to do this ritual and then ended up blowing everybody up. And so she got out of there, pregnant with that dude's uh, probably rape child, because you know I, I no slave would willingly go sleep with the master, right? Like that's a that's definitely a rape, uh, which they don't discuss, but. Um, they find out that Atticus is a descendant, a direct descendant, and so they just capture his dad just to you know lure him out here. And when he gets out there, he they stupidly leave a book of all the rules of the Order of the Ancient Dawn, and I think that that was a racist um, underestimation because uh, I believe that they probably thought maybe these dudes couldn't read. Or that they wouldn't be interested in reading, and uh, that was a that was a, a slight. Unless now that I'm thinking about it, Caleb Braithwaite, the son, left that book on purpose, which could have also been the case because there's a lot of twisty twisty stuff going on. But Samuel Braithwaite, the dad, he wants to use Atticus in a ritual that will give him I don't know unlimited power. It's vague. Uh, but when they, there's a baller move, just the best, like one of the coolest parts. And that's when Atticus is in the room, like the dining room with all of the Order of the Ancient Dawn, at least that chapter or whatever. Uh, all these like rich, important, powerful white men. And he, they're all like just staring at him, you know, and all this stuff. And he gets up and he goes, my name is Atticus Turner. And if I'm not mistaken, um, you know, like he says, I'm an ancestor. I'm a, of the, of the guy. Um, who's the guy? It was, um, I don't know the, not Braithwaite, but the, the, the other dude that was, that was, um, the main, the main source the one that guy that blew himself up. Doesn't matter. Uh, he, if I, and if I'm a, and if I'm a descendant, that means that I'm the highest ranking person in here which means that you all have to listen to me. So I want all of you to get up right now, leave your food, and just go. And after, like, a moment, they get up and they leave. And he just, I mean, the balls and the amount of, like, just fuck you from Atticus Turner in that point was so cool because he knew he was right, but he wasn't 100%, <laughs> and it could have backfired. But he did it, and he kicked ass at it, and... um Loved it. Loved him for that. So, the one that doesn't leave is a young man, and that's Caleb Braithwaite. And that is um, 
Samuel's son, who is very important coming up. So uh, he changes, uh, Atticus changes something. And so when they do the, uh, when they do the ritual, it ends up backfiring and, and killing everybody and burning the place down, um, except for Atticus. And they had warned all the help, so the, like the staff, so like the staff got out, and Letitia and George. Oh, and they rescued Montos, or, uh, Montrose from from down in a cellar. Whatever. That's I mean that's like side stuff. And then uh, they escape, and they all go back to to Chicago, and that ends the first kind of like Lovecraft country. And I thought it was great. I thought it was very cool, and it sets up this this that's more i think of the hp lovecraftian version of it all i'm assuming again i haven't read it but yeah um then we get into kind of the ghost story uh which is which is fun it reminds me of the episode of angel (laughs) when cordelia moves into her new apartment and she meets her poltergeist uh roommate who scares her in the beginning but then Moving forward throughout the seasons, uh, they become buddies, and he kind of helps her out in certain situations, and um, it's great. Although, the ramifications of that, which I think are still probably present in this, is that that ghost, I mean, he's probably watching you shower and stuff, right? Like, if you bring someone over, if Cordelia ever brought over a man and and started smashing, which I'm sure she did, uh, you know, that ghost was there. Like, and why would he not watch, I guess? If you're a ghost and you don't have a lot of things to do. Also, if you were a poltergeist, and, and if you could physically adjust things around the world, could you technically play some video games or watch TV? Because if that's the case, being a poltergeist is not the worst way to spend an afterlife. If you can just kind of... I mean, and I know that I'm following this up by saying how pervy he is that he looks at people in the shower, and that's not why I'm saying it. I'm more, let's just forget that I said that. Let's maybe I edit that out later. But let's just let's just say that uh, we, I'm mainly focusing on the video game part. But that would be fun, right? If um, <laughs> whatever. I don't. Anyway, so Letitia is looking to buy a uh she gets an inheritance from her mother and she decides to use it um she wants to buy a house uh to rent out and so she gets this crazy deal from this shady-esque sort of uh realtor guy this white guy who who says he'll help her out um and she buys this very cool in a white neighborhood big house it's 14 bedrooms and it's uh, it's called the Winthrop house and that's named after Hiram Winthrop who is her live-in ghost so she has to kind of um deal with the ghost for a little bit right um and they uh but and that's just I mean it's just like a back and forth it's it's cool you you meet you get like the relationship between her and Ruby a little bit Ruby doesn't want to mess around with, uh, like Ruby's pissed that she spent the inheritance on a house and didn't tell her and then she's like oh you bought a fucking haunted house really and so Ruby doesn't really want to have anything to do with this house her, and Ruby's just like in a, in a space in her head where she she doesn't know what she wants to do with life um, and so Letitia though on the other hand is like no I want to fucking start this house I want to um, I want to you know, have people live in here, uh, but this is where we see the nasty side of moving into a white neighborhood, which is didn't. It was very difficult to do for, as a black person at the time, right? It was impossible without people doing the things that happen here, which is you know throwing bricks through windows or you know trying to, and then like fucking up the car that was outside their house. So they throw this big party, um, and. They they bring over a bunch of dude like big dudes to uh, park the car, and get out, make sure that people know that they're these big dudes, and then leave the car out in front to you know make sure that they knew that they were still there. Uh, some some like cool tricks, but then um, they they start harassing her, um, and then at, they throw manure like they show up and they throw a bunch of shit at her house, uh, but then when these three little these three young dudes they break in to try to burn the place down and the ghost uh and the ghost like fucks them up and puts them all in the basement and uh she so her and the ghost and Letitia end up becoming like 
friends. So almost exactly like the Cordelia thing. But like they end up becoming they work together. So it's like they're they're they both understand that and I think she threatens him at some point, uh, to to be if she's like, If you kill me, I'm gonna be a ghost and I'm gonna I'm gonna haunt you. So like deal with it. So anyway, they become friends and uh that's that chapter. It's 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 fine. <laughs> It's not my not my favorite. It's but um, but it does set up the the house, which is important because that that's like where they all because up in the up in the up in the like the um, one of the rooms there's a our oh god what's it called a uh shit it's called a arbor arboretum no that's sounds like a burrito from Taco Bell um. Shit. Anyway, they find this this Oh, I'm such an idiot. It's a a 3D representation of our solar system that spins around on its own with all the planets, you know? So, whatever that is called, <laughs> they find one of those in the like the one of the the floors, one of the rooms of the Winthrop house and it fascinates uh, Horus, who is um, Hippolyta's son, and uh, Hippolyta herself, and they, I don't know if they find a key right now, but, um, I, yeah, I think they find a key, two keys that, she, that Hippolyta holds on to when they're, like, looking at it, which, uh, so, but uh, they, oh, yeah, 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 so, Caleb Braithwaite, then, um, he's back in the story, he blackmails the Montrose and his brother and they have to break into a museum to steal a book and the book is hidden in this uh, really cool booby trap that they figure out using their like being clever about it so it's like suspended in this like zero gravity kind of chamber and they they don't lose anyone thankfully they they're able to pull the guy back because they worked as a team whereas opposing like I think there's a dead person in there that tried to do it on his own but they realize that, like, if you if you are trying to hide something there, you're going to be able to want to come back and get it. So there's got to be, like, a switch to turn this thing off. And so they found the switch, and they turned it off. And they go, and they get the, the they get the books. And they're, they think that they're trying to be um, secret about it by doing it the day before they were supposed to do it. So that, that way they could switch the book out and give Caleb um, a different book and not the Book of Names, which is this crazy powerful book that they just found um but the reason they're even the, the blackmail behind it all is that caleb stole their um abdullah's book which is this then you find out about uh abdullah who was the ancestor of of georgia montrose and she escaped slavery i think it, like slavery ended and so she then um went about i think it took her 15 years or so but she then started writing down because she has a photographic memory every job and every um act of punishment against her and she added up the total the total i think she charged eight or twelve dollars a day for her labor and then uh like twenty dollars every time someone whipped her um or thirty dollars or whatever and she it was all calculated on whatever, and she would each year the family would get together after she passed. They would get together and recalculate the interest to see what it would be worth today, uh, or today and there today, so the fifties. Um, and which I mean, I, I love that that concept, and like I wonder if there really are any any families out there that have done something like that. That would be interesting to know, and like to see if they ever got uh, you know. Uh, reparations for that because I know that people feel differently about all these sorts of things but if a family even 200 years ago used slave labor to make their family have generational wealth over the next 200 years and now we have rich 1% people that have directly benefited from that then shouldn't the slaves that were there and did the work for it, shouldn't they get a portion of that? Their their descendants get a portion of that. Because it's like, 
I understand that people say, well, why do they deserve our money? Like that, that, oh, I don't understand that. I'm just saying that's stupid. Like, cause it's not the generational wealth part of it is like, it's not really your money. It's, it's your, it's money passed down from people that you're related to 200 years ago, but it's, but they, you know, they also, it, it's, they didn't do the work for it. If, if that happened today, it would be a moral outrage. People would be like, no, absolutely not. You don't get this money. This, they, you didn't work for it. You know, you, you, you took slaves and you, you forced people against their will to make this shit. Um, anyway, again, fuck, I'm not going to cure racism. I'm not even, why am I even, let's just move on. But I do think the idea of it is interesting. I would like to know if there's things like that out there. Um, so after they leave with the, so they leave the, mu- the secret room at the museum. Uh, they have the actual book of names and Caleb is there because, uh, the detectives were thinking that these two dudes were gonna, uh, that these guys were gonna fuck him over, which, they, I mean, which they were, but you know, for good reasons. And they take the book and the guys get out lucky without having to, I guess, get arrested or get killed, which could have been, uh, could have been something. Uh, could have been a real thing that happened because they, of course, just they, I guess people back then just really enjoyed killing people, just killing black people. And again, this is a book. It's a it's a drama. It's a fictionalized version of events. So none of these people really existed. But at the same time, this there's no way that this isn't a a, a pretty realistic depiction of probably some events that happened back then. This probably wasn't an everyday thing, but I can't imagine that this stuff didn't happen. Maybe the like the when when Letitia tried moving into a white neighborhood, that shit probably happened every day. And the Sundown County, holy fucking shit, I didn't even know that existed. But um, anyway, then we get to the one part of the book where I'm where this is I'm gonna say con, like pro con, because it's my favorite chapter. But I feel like the TV show did it better. And that doesn't happen very often for me, where I think a movie or a TV show does better than the book. Because, you know, when you're, when you're reading a book, I think... And, and I have uh, co-workers that I work with that don't read books. I don't think they've ever read a book. And they ask me why I think books are better than movies. And, of course, you can say that, like, building something in your own head, you get more freedom, you, it's, it's a more realized vision, you know, sometimes, and, um, and using your own imagination, I think, is a lot more fun to do, because it, it makes your brain work a little bit more to, to get the same, like, instead of just cutting down on the, because when you're watching a movie, that takes care of sound and visual right there, so, um, you don't have you're not your brain's not working to create those things it's just working to process them so uh but what i really think the thing that makes that makes tv shows and and movies uh not as great is that you don't get to see the thoughts of the characters right you don't get their internal monologues like the reason i like hunger games the book over hunger games the movie i think and the only reason i'm using that is because uh that i I heard about Hunger Games, the movie coming out back in the day when the first one came out in theaters. And I found on Kindle Hunger Games. And so I started reading it the night, like the Thursday night before the movie came out. And it's such a fun, quick, like action-y, action-packed read that I finished it at like 8 a.m. I just went all night. I just did an all-nighter on, on Hunger Games. And I was like, fuck, that was fun. And so I went and saw the 10 a.m. showing of Hunger Games, which was the quickest and most complete version of a what, reading a book to watching a movie that I think you can even do is do a whole all night or read a book and then go see a movie. And I will say that I was watching the movie just thinking, huh, it's really missing something without her thoughts the whole time where it's just her just kind of quietly going through the fourth. And I understand that's what they're going for. And if you just watch the movie, there's nothing wrong with it because you're like, oh, she's a hunter. It's all this cool stuff. But having her thoughts really makes a difference. It flushes out her characters. I think Katniss in the in the movie is a little like cold-hearted and, and unapproachable and unlikable. But I think in the book, 
she, there's reasons for that, and she, it, she's not even that unlikable. Like she doesn't come off as unlikable in the book because you see the the reasonings behind her actions. And so we get to after for some reason a Hunger Games uh, tangent, uh, we get to um, Hippolyta dis- disturbs the universe, which is absolutely a phenomenal, just very cool thing. So Hippolyta, the uh, George's wife. Uh, she has not been a major character in this book so far. She's just kind of in in the in the show. I believe she's kind of like an overweight, um, middle aged, just woman, just black woman, and 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 nothing's like special. You know, like you wouldn't think like oh in this in the show she's gonna do anything, or even in this book. But she is a she likes to travel, and she's a contributor to the um, the Safe Negro Guide, and she really like. Even later on in the book, she says, like, you know, George, I just, you know how I get, I just want to get in my car, and I just want to drive, and I just want to, um, I want to get out there and explore, which I get, like, that's so cool. So she has these two keys that she found in that solar system uh, map, 3D map, uh, and it has an address on it, and it's an observatory, and she, it, she does, like, this flashback where uh, she was a little girl. And she's always been fascinated with space. And they were announcing that they had found Planet X, which her and her father had been looking for ever since she was like a kid. Ever since they discussed the idea of there being a Planet X, her and her dad would go look for it with their telescope. She, uh, when they announced that Planet X has been discovered, she gets a stat. Like, she's a little bummed because she didn't find it, of course. But, you know, what were the odds? So, but then she goes... Maybe we, maybe I can name it. So she's going through all the, like the names, and she discovers the best one would be Pluto because of, and it makes sense in the book. He he explains the 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 god Pluto versus she had like two gods lined up, and I think she went with Pluto. And so she wrote it down. She sent it in the mail to the observatory that was dealing with this. A few months later, or weeks, or whatever, there's a newspaper, and they're saying that the planet is now called Pluto, and she heart like gets el- you know elated, but then she sees that it's a different girl, some girl that lives in England, and the only reason that the little girl in England got it was because her family was rich enough to afford a telegraph, as opposed to her. Uh, um, uh, Hippolyta, young Hippolyta, having to go to the, to the school, you know, get one of their envelopes and put it into the mail service, so it just got there too late. And it's just kind of heartbreaking and sad, and not necessarily, you know, I mean, that's just, that's just the disparage, the disparage um, of of wealth between, you know, I guess whites and blacks. But like that, uh, that's just like that. That one hurt my heart a little bit. It was really sad. So. Cut to her as like a young woman in college, and she would she kind of breaks into this observatory, um, which is cool. She reminds me of a friend that I have named Michelle, who is one of those like rule bla- rule breakers, where like she'll go places she's not allowed, and then sweet talk her way into letting them keep her there. And that's exactly what Hippolyta does. She goes to this observatory, and she uh, just sweet talks herself to this like cute white boy who lets her in and he lets her look through the telescope and it's amazing so she makes it an effort to anywhere anytime she comes across an observatory uh out on her travels for the safe new york guide or whatever she tries to like break in i'm using quotes here break in uh she doesn't really break in she goes and she knocks on the door and she asks can i look and then they sometimes people will quiz her on like how much do you know and she's super knowledgeable about space so they'll be like impressed and let her in despite her skin color and all that stuff and i mean and you just think god if she was just in a different time if she was like existed today she would be uh, like she would be a, an, an astronaut, you know, like it would, or like she'd be working for NASA and it just sucks that she has to like con, you know, quote unquote her way into these, into these places or whatever, charm her way and more. So she goes to this astronomical observatory that um, was owned by Hiram Winthrop, the, the house owner, who was one of the ancient the dawn of the, ancient uh order of the ancient dawn guys and um 
he <laughs> so she goes in she sneaks back to the guards past the guard shack and she goes up there and she sees this uh telescope i guess but it's not it doesn't like go out and just like it doesn't show anything there's no opening for the for the telescope to move around or, or do anything right so she sees this group of numbers and she starts she types in like i think one or two or whatever and it opens a doorway to another dimension another planet right and she starts typing in numbers kind of indiscriminately looking through the hole seeing all of these different places and she's fascinated by it and she um eventually she uh, she says that she looks in the back of the book and, and uses the answer key, which I think is she had numbers that she had written down or that had been written down. So uh, she just types those numbers in and it opens up on this beach and this planet. And so she steps out because, and it, I mean, and I love that uh, when she's going through, she puts her finger through, but it's kind of like painful and resistance. And then she um, realizes that you can't do this in half measures. If you're going to go through, you have to go through. So she steps through very bravely very cool. And now she's in this like beach area and she looks up and there's a cottage, like a gated like like place with stairs leading up there. And she and like, whoa, uh, what are the chances that on this different dimension there's a thing? So she goes up there and she meets a woman um, named oh God, it wasn't Pearl, but Ida. She meets a woman named Ida who tells her the tragic story about how she ended up there, which was um, that Hiram, uh, Winthrop, to punish her, uh, like her uh, her son, or sorry, her daughter, Pearl. Um, hang on one sec. Her son, per or her, sorry, her daughter, Pearl, eloped with, Winthrop's, Winthrop's son, which was a interracial marriage at the time, and in order to punish Ida and the other employees, he puts them in a completely different dimension in this little house that gives them, um, basically has a Star Trek replicator type thing where you just type in a, a number and it gives you this bag of, of food that could be ranging from uh, something decent ish to absolute foul like like bugs like larva coming like uh, uh coming out or whatever the grubs that you'd have to eat and the punishment was is that they're putting like went through put them there so that they would never see anyone ever again it's like this is a a, a fate worse than than death because you're gonna be all the way out here by yourselves with no one else and eventually the other ones die, and now it's just Ida. And so Ida helps Hippolyta escape. Uh, and when... Oh, um, and then when um, Ida... When, when uh, Hippolyta asks Ida to come with her, like, Ida's, uh, Hi Ida's like, no. Look, this is, like, kind of her home now. She doesn't want the... Uh, she doesn't want anyone to know her location because she doesn't want anyone to be able to find Pearl. But then later on you find out that Pearl and her husband uh, died in a, in a racist fire, um, which, uh, I'm, wait, no, am I, am I wrong here? I believe, yeah, they're the ones that died. They're the ones that, um, that got when we get to that chapter. But anyway, okay, so uh Hippolyta, Hippolyta comes back and um she she but she leaves her comic book on the ground, the one that her son writes. Um her her artist son uh Horace writes these comic books and she accidentally leaves it as she's uh leaving because the these white guys find her and then uh they end up dying um through various means. And so she, that's the end of that. But the reason I like the TV show better in this particular situation is uh, the episode is called I Am in the, in the show. And uh, it is crazy how much like, so she actually, so 
in the book she only like she looks through the the door and she sees these different portals but in the show she walks through them and she meets these uh um, like she learns all this stuff, she sees all these things. Um, it's been a while since I've it's been a while since I've watched it, and, I, and I'm gonna probably watch the show, uh, or at least this episode again. Um, but she becomes like an Amazon. Uh, she like discovers who she is in a way that's crazy. Like she almost gets like access to unlimited knowledge. Like the 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 universe opens up in this infinite way in front of her and she like understands it like of all the characters that could have went through there like Atticus wouldn't have gotten the same um Horace might have gotten some sort of revelation but her being the one that could understand it being the smartest one there she like really like I've watched this 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 episode of 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 television I am of Lovecraft Country might be my favorite television episode of just any series. And I'm putting a lot of them up there. There's, you know, you have the Once More Feeling Buffy episode. Uh, you have the musical episode from Psych. Um, I know those are both musical episodes. And that's not going to be a theme. But, uh, you know, there's some Breaking Bad episodes that are pretty up there. You know, but... Something about I Am, this episode, is just, it hits me. It reminded, you know what it was? And maybe it won't hit me the same because I've seen everything everywhere all at once. But this was the prototype to everything everywhere all at once, I feel. Like this walked, or this ran so so everything everywhere could fly. Because that is one of my favorite movies that I've seen in a long time. One of the most impactful, just kind of like gets you in the feels and it's just exciting to watch kind of movies. Loved it. But, um, I am, I feel like is even more, it's like less silly than everything. So it, it feels more grounded, feels more real. And she like learns a lot of, a lot of stuff. Um, God, it's just, it's so good. So, like, even if you don't want to watch a whole series on this, which I think you should, um, don't just skip to episode 7. There's only 10 episodes, so, like, just watch it. It's a great series. It's what got me to read this book, actually. Um, uh, I, I did, I've never even heard about this book, and I watched the show, and then when I finished the show, I had to read it, and... I'm glad that they're different. They're they're so different to the book and the and the show. Like I even think they say that the show is inspired by the novel, right? There's episodes that don't exist. Um, there's storylines that don't exist in the book that are in here because the novel is only a handful of chapters. One, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So there's at least two more um, episodes, and some of these chapters are very like. Quick, so I would imagine that uh, they contain that they sort of double them up, doubled up on some of them. So um, then we uh, we get into the next chapter, Jekyll and Hyde Park, and that is a great title. <laughs> I'm always a fan of of great titles, and that one is so good. Uh, so Ruby, we haven't really talked, checked in with her much. She runs into Caleb uh, Braithwith, uh, Braithwaite. As she's making her way to Letitia's party, but because Letitia's house is haunted, she doesn't really want to be there. So she ends up like kind of just absconding with Caleb, but she doesn't know who Caleb is. She's never met this guy. He's just kind of a, a cute white guy who is into her a little bit, it feels like. And so he takes her um, takes her out on a good time, and then he makes her a proposal. And she decides to, she agrees to it. And then she wakes up the next morning as a white woman. And it takes her a while to get a greet, like to get used to it because it scares the shit out of her. She didn't know what she was like signing up for. But once she uh, adjusts to it, she starts to get addicted to it a little bit. Like, um, because the way she's treated out in public, like by 
people is different. One of the first encounters is she goes to the store of this woman who rejected to hire hiring her, and she sees that the woman is there, uh, and so she puts a scarf in that woman's purse and then tells the police that she stole um, stole it or whatever. And they, like, uh, believe her instantly because she's a white woman, an attractive white woman um, with red hair. And <laughs> and she starts, so, uh, so she starts using, so she starts working for Caleb. And they come up with this whole thing where she lives in this house and she's both the maid and the occupant of the house. Um, so she's Hillary, she calls herself Hillary Everest at first because Hillary is the man who climbed Mount Everest, and she has always wanted to be a Sherpa. It's always been kind of a dream job because she thought, well, why wouldn't you want to work a job where you get to look at those views every day? And uh, later she changes her name to Hillary Hyde to kind of, um, because it is sort of her bad persona in a way. Uh, So she has to go to this uh, meeting where you see all the different how like the different lodges of the order of the ancient dawn and they are all meeting up and that's when caleb comes out and says that they should all join forces that like hey we're all doing our own things we're keeping secrets from each other it's time that we just pulled our resources and started something bigger than us and like you know and then but i think i should probably be the one to, to run it is kind of what he's doing um so Later, Ruby goes down into the basement and she discovers that the white woman that she keeps turning into is down there in a being like uh, frozen, you know, like the kept alive. Um, and uh, she is being used her blood to make that potion that Ruby keeps taking. And there's like a lot of that potion in there. So she. Uh, yeah, it's like she stays though. Like she likes it too much, I guess. And she stays. And that's, I mean, like she's so. Ruby's kind of a. Does that make her a flawed character? Because I was thinking about like Ruby's probably the most unlikable one in the group, and I think she's written that way. But why? I don't think that she is wrong for not wanting to stay in an actual haunted home. Like, if you're legit afraid of ghosts that actually exist, then, yeah, I don't see, like, that's a problem. Um, And, yeah, I would imagine that if you found a potion that turned you into somebody that the general public views as equal as opposed to sub-equal, then, like, why not? I mean, but it, it, it does, it does change, you know, like, like, is it a betrayal of being black or is it is it like a like a cheat code that the, she shouldn't be using she should be using i don't know but um it's definitely a i don't know it's 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 sad because like she knows that she shouldn't like it but she does so we get then to the next chapter uh narrow house where um and, and by the way Moving forward. I'm not going to go chapter by chapter for every book. It's just that this one happens to be built like TV shows. Um, like episodes. So, you know, like most books can just be thought of as like, you know, these chunks or whatever. But that's this kind of does this. But we get to the Narrow House, which you just find out is about um, the the guy who built that um, observatory. I think it's his, his daughter and uh, the guy that, that she ran off with. Um... They both were killed. They get killed. They get burned down to death. And so Montrose, who is sent there by Caleb um, with Atticus to go find to go find uh, Henry Winthrop, the 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 son of the guy who built the house. They find out that he died, and they were there to get the notebooks. And Montrose uh, sits there, and he. Uh, they, they like, he, um, the, the ghost tells Montrose like his entire story and Montrose sits there cause he like wants to, 
Montrose is like, I want to help my son. Like, these people are trying to kill my son. They're using him for this stupid sorcery stuff. You should know you're the son of this guy. He's talking to the ghost of, of Henry, uh, or, uh, or, or he's talking to the ghost of Henry Winthrop. And the ghost is malevolent at first and, and, and violent um, and accusatory. But then when, when, when Montrose says he wants to save his son, that's when, uh, that's when the, the ghost shows him what happened. And it's a sad, you know, how they how they died, how they um, they tried to make it, but they died. Um, there's a across the uh, there's another address. So they were like 213 West Elm Street, but on 213 East Elm Street, there's a guy, and, and the neighbors have a sign pointing at his house saying "Nigger Lover," and because he helped that family out, and so like it's this. You see it everywhere, and um, they get killed. And um, but after, like Atticus walks in, and Montrose is just sitting there, and he's got these ashen-covered notebooks. So he does find them. Uh, then we get into, I would say, maybe my probably my least favorite chapter. I don't know, but um, Horace, he's a kid. You follow him around. It's him and his buddies talking about different like stuff that they've heard happen to different people about you know like hey don't trust this guy you know like they'll uh, like like racist things that have happened. But uh, one of his um, oh uh, yeah so but the, the the main part of it is that the detectives find Horace and they ask him about his comic book and when Horace accidentally unintentionally tells them that his mother had the book. They put a spell on him because there's part of the order of um, that he can't say anything. And so he, anytime he does, he gets this like, he gets sick. He gets this like itching feeling. He just can't, right? And so um, he tries, uh, like he tries to, this, this there's this devil doll that somebody um, finds uh, and it tries to attack him. Uh, but... And that's and that's what like I didn't really care. Like there's a devil doll chasing around. It's like almost feels like Chucky, I guess. Um, but Ruby, who's the, who uh, Horace has always liked, um, he is able to using Scrabble letters spell out enough that Ruby is able to um, help. Like Ruby is able to then um, help, like piece everything together. Uh, so, uh, Ruby goes and tells Caleb, uh, Caleb then helps undo the curse. And now, uh, we are in a point where it's Caleb versus Captain Lancaster, who is the the guy who runs the order of the, um, the, the order of the ancient dawn. And now we get to the last, the last chapter, which is all, all the family gets together they share what's happened. <laughs> so I love that that happened because all of this has been happening kind of behind each other's backs. So um, Atticus and, and Montrose and George and Letitia tell you what happened at the Artem Lodge, the um, the ghost stuff that happened to Letitia, you know, the the breaking in and getting the book, which Hippolyta doesn't like, but then uh, that George went and did that, but then George doesn't like that Hippolyta went and went to a different universe different planet without telling him uh ruby does not tell them that she's been turning into a white woman that's uh she's ashamed of it i think and she doesn't tell them uh and then uh montrose tells them about the narrow house the which is the name of the the they changed their name to narrow i think um henry and and pearl uh and then uh horace tells them about what happened to him and they all come up with a plan to really uh, come out on top. And so, oh, one of the things that Caleb did to get the book of names was that he gave them what, um, Ab- Ab- Abdullah's book, they were owed like 300 and something thousand dollars. And so Caleb just gave them that money uh, as a, like to pay back their debt as sort of to like make him seem like a good guy. But I like that Montrose is like, no, you don't come off as a good guy for paying what you owe, you know? Uh, so that was pretty cool. And, uh, the, so everyone gets together. Uh, they, 
the Caleb has a plan, Lancaster has a plan, uh, but they uh, they get Winthrop's ghost to help them, and they end up uh, um, Lancaster gets lured into a room. Uh, he, he gets swallowed by this like shadow monster thing, um, and then Atticus changes some letters of that of that atom language, and uh, he. Uh, so he, he alters, that's what it is. He alters Caleb's, um, thing, his, his immunity. And so, uh, they drive, they drive him out, uh, out of state, uh, Caleb. And they go like, Hey, so you don't have immunity anymore or it's a different kind. You're not allowed to come into these, uh, and I'd stay out of these areas. They hand him a safe Negro guide and they go, I'd stay out of these, out of these, uh, areas. And, um, Unless you're, you'll get real sick, and if you try to use magic, and that's the worst part, if you try to use any magic, you're gonna get you're gonna get sick or whatever. And so he he reaches back into his brain, he finds he can't do magic, and he thinks you know it's like why would you do this? And it's like it's cruel or whatever. And then they drove away, which I love. So he gets his comeuppance. They buy the house, the Winthrop house, outright um, with that three hundred thousand dollars or some of it, uh, and then they put a a safe in their house and they win. So they beat Caleb. None of them die. Ruby, during the final mission, does disguise herself as Hillary and helps them and never tells them that that's what she did. So as of right now in the story, if if, if there was a right now, because there is a sequel, so there is going to be more to it. Um, I don't know if, if they're going to continue on these threads or not. But as of right now, she might still... Because she has full access to an unlimited supply of that potion. And, or at least a bunch of it. So, and she has that house. So I don't know what's going to happen with Ruby. So, how did I feel about the book? I really liked it. Uh, I think it's 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 got some, some pretty gruesome parts. It teaches you a lot about, like, the Jim Crow era South. And just... But in a in an interesting way that's not just like a history book, you know, um, where it's just facts. Like this is an, this is a fictionalized version, so he's allowed to play around with uh, themes and stuff. And since it's based in the supernatural science fictiony kind of um, universe, like it just gives it this eerie backdrop of you know the racism uh, is bad enough, but there's also monsters lurking, you know, and it's not just racist. And so, um, yeah, I, if I'm going to, so let's see, what's my rating? I should have thought of this before. If I was going to give this a rating of, um, what was a big theme throughout all of this? I don't want to, I don't want to say out of five racisms, what would I give this? But, uh, let's see. Okay. Out of, um, uh, uh, okay, out of um, Cthulhu arms. <laughs> I don't know how many arms Cthulhu has. I'm going to say there's um, five Cthulhu arms. So out of five Cthulhu arms, I'm going to give this a four. Uh, I think it was great. I think it's definitely worth a read. I think it's a little short. I think he could have done more with some of the chapters. Uh, but... Uh, it's enough to get me super excited. Maybe a 4.5, maybe four and a half Cthulhu arms, if we're going to be honest. Um, cause it, it really, it was engaging, but the show it's worth both worth watching and reading. So, or listening to, um, so yeah. Uh, Oh, let's do next week's movie because I didn't say that. Uh, I didn't say that this time, did I? One sec, I'm just going to pause this. Okay, so the first, uh, the book I'm going to be reading next week is brought to you by Austin from Fried Rice Podcast. (laughs) Uh, He recommended that I read Stranger in a Strange Land by Robert A. Heinlein, a book I have not read. I have read Heinlein's work before I've read Starship Troopers uh, which I quite enjoyed and so this is about I think a guy in a Martian moving to Earth 
um, with powers and stuff, a little bit of reverse John Carter, it sounds like. Um, so it's interesting. It was either that or George Orwell's 1984. Um, so uh, if you would like to recommend a book for me to read next, um, we have a... Uh, we have a, a voicemail. I won't answer it. It doesn't even ring. Uh, just if you want to leave a voicemail, you could seven zero two eight two nine zero one one seven. Again, that's seven zero two eight two nine zero one one seven. If you call that number, listen to our fun little fried rice podcast voice recording and leave a um, leave what what book you want to read. I, I, chances are, I'll read it. Uh, I will definitely take requests, so if you want to hear my thoughts on it, let's do it. This has been uh, Wednesday Night Book Club. Let me just get this outro music real quick. There we go. <laughs> it's so intense. Thank you, AI. It's Wednesday Night Book Club Jesus Christ. It's so bad. All right, well, uh, <laughs> we'll see you next week. This has been a lot of fun. Have a good night, guys.